Go ahead, Doug, start now, thanks. He's off visiting his mom in West Africa, so he should have good stories when he comes back. Um, everyone's sophisticated enough about this to keep your microphones on mute unless you are talking. Um, so with that said, we've got everyone in the room now, so I'll turn it over to Sarah Taylor. Okay, hi, hi everyone. Um, and thank you for coming tonight and um, sharing my love of plants. I'm, I'm so happy to um, be here and listen to our great speakers and just hear from everybody about um, the plant world along the Lower Willamette. Um, it's fascinating. And um, so I'm really looking forward to it. And we are going to have a complimentary um, nature plant walk along the Willamette River on February 27th at noon. And we'll, we'll remind people about that. But I, I wanna start tonight by just, um, you know, remembering and honoring um, Art McConville who, who passed um, this week. And he was um, from the Yakima Nation and was just a, a true supporter of this process, um, worked with PHCC and, you know, came to many ceremonies and, and offered a lot of wisdom to all of us along um, this river and the Columbia. So just want to just take a moment just to, just to really thank him for all he, he gave our river community. Um, so just take a second to, and if anybody else feels that they want to say something, um, you know, feel, feel like you can, but I just really know that I personally appreciated all that, all that he offered. And I don't know whether people know that he had passed, but um, he, he did just a few days ago. And, and with that, I would like to say that we do recognize that we are all, most of us are living on, on stolen land. And, and as we do this work of the cleanup along the lower Willamette River, you know, we are, you know, forever humbled by um, the realization that for time immemorial that the tribes in the area had taken care of the river and the forest and the wetlands and the prairies as one system. And they did that so, um, so miraculously and um, just want to recognize the, the centuries, the last few centuries and, and the harm that we have done to a piece of land and a river that was cared for so well. And um, we now have the ability to commit, not just the ability, but actually the privilege and the delight of getting to know what a whole system can look like. And, and, and we have the opportunity for, you know, the, the baby Ellis in this room and for all the next generations um, to, to heal this, this, this river and this whole landscape. And, you know, I'm a person who who loves plants, and I I understand that the river and the and the plants are are deeply deeply connected and are not separate. So as we go about this restoration project, I just want to always honor um, the tribes that lived here for time immemorial and all the wisdom that that they bring um, to our restoration work. So. Anyway, thank you, um, everyone. We are so lucky tonight to have three, um, three great guests um, who know a lot about plants. I kind of put out an email and said, okay, who are our plant experts in Portland? And I, I just got a host of names. So, you know, that was just amazing to me how many um, great names that I was um, given. We're going to hear from each one of these people, and then we'll have a time where if you want to join in. Um, but, you know, truly, our hope is that um, we will take what we learned tonight and put that into our restoration work and um, and and go about this in a, in a thoughtful way, not just cleaning the river, but also um, caring for the plants. Um, 
along the river banks. So we're going to start and we are honored to welcome Greg Archuleta, I hope I am saying your name right and I apologize if I'm not, of the Clackamas, Chinook, Santiam, Kalapuya, and Shasta, and a member of the Confederate Tribes of the Grand Ronde Confederation. Greg is a cultural policy analyst with the Grand Ronde Tribe. He teaches about the culture and history of the tribes of Western Oregon, including ethnobotany. Oh, wow. This is interesting. Carving. 15-year-old Russian girl that we saw do all those uh -oh. uh, quads that hardly any men can do. She did four of them. She, What's I haven't seen here? like that in my life. She just failed her drug test. Sure. Nothing changes, does it? Wow. Um, someone needs to mute their um, oh, so the conversation in the background. ARA oh, microphones on. Okay, it looks like we're good. Thank you. Well, anyway, we know something great happened at the Olympics as well. But um, anyway, we're back to Greg, who, um, including ethnobotany, carving, cedar hat making, native art design, and basketry. Greg has worked with tribal elders, artisans, Confluence Project, and many others to share the traditions, culture, and history of the tribes that make up the Confederate tribes of Grand Ronde. We are grateful for the wisdom and knowledge he brings to our restora restoration work. Thank you, Greg, so much. Hello, everybody. Uh, am I going to go first then? Yep. Thank okay. you. Okay. All righty. Greg, do you have some slides to share? This is Scott Burr. Yeah. Okay. So and I'm getting ready to share now. Okay. Sounds good. So I think you can see that now. You see my opening slide? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, well, Slahi, everybody. Naga mislike Kabashus Tam Tam, Naga mislike Ikwa Uksan, Naga name Greg Archuleta, Naga mislike Kama Kaba Gresham Ilihi, Naga Sawas Ilihi Telekum. And so, first, I wanted to kind of welcome you in our tribal language that we use today, the Chinook Wawa, and just kind of said that I'm just really happy to be here tonight. And that, um, uh, as mentioned, my name is Greg Archuleta, a member of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ron, and that um, I live in Gresham, Oregon, actually, and uh, the tribe has an office in Portland, so uh, I actually work out of our Portland office. Um, a little about myself, as mentioned, thank you, sir, for that introduction, and just a little more is that, um, as mentioned, um, Descendant from the Willamette Tumwater people that lived on the west end side of Oregon City at the Falls area. And uh, the direct descendant of the Tai'i, Oregon City John, who signed the treaty on behalf of the Willamette Tumwater people. And then the other side of my tribal family, I'm also a uh, direct descendant of, of Chief Wachino, who signed on behalf of the Clackamas Chinook. And so the Willamette Tumwaters were on the west side of the Willamette and the Clackamas Chinook on the east side of the Willamette. And then we had also, we had fishing, our fishing places there at Willamette Falls, Tumwater. And then also we had fishing sites at Cascade Rapids. We had family there uh, before um, the creation of the Cascade Rapids are underwater now due to Bonneville Dam, but that was also a fishing place uh, in my family that we had. So uh, my connections to the lower Willamette and Columbia River area in the region is, is very, very tight. It goes back generations that Sarah mentioned of the tribal people being living in this area. And so just really grateful for that. And um, as mentioned, those tribes under the Willamette Valley Treaty were relocated to the Grand Ronde Reservation, which is about 30 miles um, west of Salem between um, Link uh, Salem and Lincoln City about at the foothills there. So most people probably know where that's at if you're local. So I'm just very happy to be here today. Um, 
the presentation. Um, it's the month of February, and so in the Clackamas Chinook, we have this thing about the, the seasons, the moons, and uh, she is going is what the February moon is called. And when she came, nothing at all was growing. The name of the moon is she is going, which is about February. When I shall shine, everything will be sprouting, flowers, leaves, grass. They said to her, your name is she who is going. So that's kind of the, the month that we're in now. And uh, people are starting to talk about the plants as they're blooming. We're starting to see the early ones start to show. Um, so that's kind of um, the seasonal round that we're in. And as I present uh, tonight, I'll kind of talk and share kind of connected to that seasonal round. And one of the things that I usually do about this time of year is I'll go out um, above the Willamette River, Kamasia Preserve there, and I'll go look and see if the, the camas is, is sprouting. Um, the camas is one of our important tribal foods throughout the Willamette Valley. Um, the Clackamas uh, Chinook and the Lower Willamette and the Columbia, there are different places, of course. Um, historically, at Camas in uh, Washugo area, Vancouver area, had plains and prairies of it. Um, and then just uh, smaller areas here on the Oregon side, but we have places like Kamasia. Um, uh, Kanema has, has some there, places like that. Um, but the early Camas, the early shoots, the, the food food sources were getting low, then the, the bulbs of the, of the camas plant would be gathered early and they would be boiled um, and then and used and eaten. Um, so it was one of our early, early season foods that we could rely on um, along the river. And then as the spring progresses, we have lots of different plants that start showing. Of course, one of the earlier ones is the, the currants, the red currants. And this was taken, I think I took this last year right out, right outside our office here along the Willamette River um, across from Oaks Bottom area. Um, and this is uh, the, the red currant. And then of course you have uh, other plants such as the uh, also berry or Indian plum that uh, starts blooming kind of our first sign of spring. And those, and those uh, plums from that, plant are actually edible. Um, a lot of people uh, probably wouldn't find them very agreeable, so you have to get used to the taste and things like that. But they are all actually in a wild edible plum um, that you'll see. And then of course, the, the different varieties of, of currants and lots of other berries. I'm used to using this one to cover all the berries through the season. You'll have the currants early, you'll have the, the wild strawberries we had a place um, just outside Gladstone there along the Clackamas River, which was a big uh, wild strawberry gathering area for our tribes. Um, um, so we had those kind of er early foods and things that we had that came off the landscape. One of our um, important basketry materials of this area is the hazel, the wild hazel. Um, and in a, a few weeks, we'll probably start going out and we'll start um, looking for the wild hazel. And um, today, um, uh, the, you have the commercial hazel and they actually hybrid uh, between the wild and the commercial. So you get different varieties in between hybrids. Um, but we need to have the wild flexible hazel sticks um, because the, the commercial hazel or the non-native is a uh, not as flexible, so it's more brittle and it'll break if you try to twist it like this. So we, we do a little test to kind of see how flexible it is by rolling it up, see, see if it's flexible or not, and if we'll be able to use it for gathering. And so usually in the springtime, we go out and we'll find the hazel patches. Um, and this is one that we, we, our tribes did a lot of work and care for the hazel plants. Um, one way would be through fire for burning these areas because you didn't want them to get kind of um, really thick and nilly-willy. Um, for the basketry purposes, you wanted the younger, smaller, and nice straight shoots. So um, we'd actually kind of burn the areas, and today we'll do some pruning um, to encourage that those new shoots to come up from about one to three, where prime 
for uh, basketry that we do. Um, and one of the reasons we use this is it's, uh, it heals really nicely also. So in the springtime, there's a little window of time when you can easily peel the hazel um, right before the leaves show or when the leaves are about coming out. And so that's usually when we're out gathering the, the hazel. And then related to that is the willows. Um, we have lots of willows, of course, along the Willamette and the, and the Columbia. Um, but those willows we use for things like string, um, and stuff like that, because uh, our willows in this area are more brittle. Um, if you go down into Northern California, Southern Oregon, there's more, there's varieties that are more flexible, kind of like the hazel. Um, so down there, um, you may see uh, the tribes down there using more willow. Well, up here, we'll use uh, more hazel. But they actually use more, uh, hazel a lot down there also, so the mixture. And so there's some of the peeled hazel sticks afterwards and we'll gather the hazel sticks and we'll let them um, set for a year um, before we start making things with them. And here's an example of a seed fan that's used for gathering wild sunflower seed, the tarweed. Um, and uh, the main frame, the main sticks are the hazel sticks. Um, and then the, the wrapping, uh, weaving there is from the, uh, the maple bark. So in gathering that, we do use the maple bark, so big leaf maple, um, and a little let, right, a little, not too much after the hazel, we'll go out and start looking for the hazel bark. And that's about with a time when it will peel also really well. Um, so you can see, you see a sample there where we're kind of um, removing the outer bark from the inner layer that we use. And then again, we'll, we'll take that inner layer and we'll hold it for about a year um, and then we'll use it for different purposes. Um, and then the basket here, that basket is made out of juncus, which I'll talk about a little more in a little bit. Um, bear grass, and the bear grass grows in the mountains, so you won't, you wouldn't find it uh, local, and we have to go to the mountains for that. Um, and then the hazel sticks are the frame for it that the, the juncus is wrapped around, woven around. And there you see the, the maple, there in uh, the maple's natural state, and then we'll also um, dye it a lot too. Um, we'll soak it in different dyes um, for color. And there, here's the maple bark dried and um, drying, and, and then uh, we'll use it in the basketry, and we actually have some, some dance regalia that we also uh, weave dresses that are woven um, with the maple bark. So these trees are very common along uh, the rivers and, 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 and uh, provide important sources of materials for us for different purposes. Another one is ash bark. Um, of course, there's a lot of ash along the river. Um, they really like the water. Um, and then, you know, they can uh, sustain themselves even when there's flooding and things like that for a period of time. Um, so about the same time that we gather the maple bark, we can go out and gather the ash. Um, and when we make different types of buckets like that, uh, we make it, there's cooking trays and berry picking baskets and things like that that we use the ash bark for. Um, so I don't know if the group has had much discussion about, I know mostly about contamination of the river. Um, but I know folks are concerned about the ash borer and maybe it, coming to Oregon. And I've heard um, people say, well, we'll just cut it and replace it with another, another tree. And that that's a concern as what, I don't think we really understand its relationship and ties to the river and, and the con contributions it does make to the river um, areas. Um, those stands, um, I think are pretty important. And so um, we have to look at that issues kind of making sure we really understand that relationship between the river, the water, um, and the, wet, the wet areas that it likes. Um, because I, I'm certain it serves an important role. And then as the spring moves on, then the canvas becomes ready. Um, and then the flowers will bloom, um, they'll go to seed, and then, um, 
ideally we'll kind of wait until after the, the flower seed um, and then we'll ready to gather it for the year. Um, our tribes, uh, the Clackamas, um, the Kalapuya would gather it in great quantities um, and it was an important food source. Um, I don't know if you people have read the journals of Lewis and Clark, but um, they would trade for it and then um, they have stomach problems because they wouldn't prepare it correctly. They didn't know how to kind of cook it correctly. It's got kind of an insulin type um, substance in it. And um, um, our tribes, what they would do is bake the canvas in ground ovens. And as part of that process, it would caramelize those bulbs and convert that insulin into a more digestible sugar. Um, um, so that's how our tribes uh, usually used it, baked it, and then they would dry it and then store it away for winter time. Uh, it was an important food for winter and also a big time trade item, especially for the Kalapuya of the Willamette Valley. And here's some more bulbs. And then this is uh, kind of the process there of uh, beginning to prepare it for baking. Um, usually put down um, beds of leaves of ash and maple, uh, maybe hazel leaves. Some tribes would use skunk cabbage and put them in layers of that um, and then cover them. And then they'd have um, hot rocks that would be uh, laid on the ground and then those leaves and then the camas and then cover the camas with more leaves um, and then bake it that way. Usually it took three to four days to, to bake it. Then as the season goes along, then we have the huapato. Um, this was one of the primary foods of this region of the lower uh, Willamette and, and, the, and the Columbia and this region. And if you're familiar, uh, Lewis and Clark, they seen so much of this, they deemed this area the Wapato Valley. Um, you had it all along the Columbia River and the different sloughs and ponds and stuff like that. Salvis Island on the lower Willamette here. Um, 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 we had the gathering areas here um, at Oaks, Oaks Bottom area there was actually a Clackamas gathering area for the, for the Wapato. Um, and um, this will start growing in the springtime. You'll see the leaves come out, then the flowers, and then it will seed um, later into the summertime. And then after that seeding, happens about September, and then it's time for gathering of the Wapato. Um, and I don't know if you've heard stories of how it was gathered, but uh, traditionally the women would go out into different ponds and sloughs, um, and they would use their bare feet to kind of feel for the bulbs and loosen them and they'd float to the top. Um, and then put them in their baskets or their little canoes they had for gathering the Wapato. And there's uh, lots, we've been doing a lot of work with the Wapato in this area, been studying it to see where the populations are. We did a study a couple of years ago looking at the Wapato Slough, um, working with uh, the Bureau of Environmental Services and uh, Columbia Slough group was a kind of help facilitate that process. Um, uh, we've been doing work with the Tualatin Wildlife Refuge and the restoration of Wapato Lake, which is a historic lake and um, outside of Gaston and Gaston area, there was numerous Tualatin villages around that lake. Um, and their main primary food was the, the Wapato there. Um, so when we've been working with different uh, US Fish and Wildlife, Rich Wild, Wildlife Refuge, Tualatin others, uh, looking at the Wapato populations, uh, BES. Um, and we've also been uh, working to test the bulbs, the tubers, because we don't know how safe it is to consume. Um, the tubers are a uh, um, like a little potato, and we're called the Indian potato. And you can just put them on the coals and bake them. Um, but uh, today we don't know how safe they are due to contamination. Um, and there has been um, early work that said that they actually absorb minerals and things like that. Um, so we're trying to better understand that. And then once even as we test them, trying to better understand, you know, what is a safe level of consumption. Um, 
and how long does the pesticides or the contaminants reside within the, in the tubers. And um, so that's some of the work that we're doing right now in the area and trying to better understand that. And we've seen areas here, you see this big Wapato patch here. Uh, I think this was 2016, I went out to Southeast Island and got this picture. And then I went back a few years later. Um, I didn't get the picture in here, but uh, there was no Wapato there. So there's um, some things that can greatly impact the Wapato and trying to understand what those things are too. Is, um, some of the things that we're trying to do today. Another important uh, plant is juncus. Juncus is a rush um, and used by our tribes. Um, and one of the things about uh, these materials or these plants is that some of them we use for food. So the factor of human consumption is really important. And a lot of times uh, with restoration and things like that, those things aren't taken into consideration. Um, so that's an important aspect from a travel perspective is how the different plants are used. Um, and then we have our basketry materials like juncus. And this is a, a plant that while we're not eating it, we are using it and a lot of times pinning it into our mouths because um, you got to taper the ends and stuff like that when you're working with it in the basketry and things like that. Um, so there's a concern there as, you know, as we, as we do those kind of traditional ways of, of working with the basketry you know, or is there potential for contamination or, or getting sick um, from doing those kind of activities. So those are some of the things we got to watch out for. And this is a junkus start here for a basket um, that uh, very commonly used by our tribes and uh, one of the primary basket materials also for the, the Kalapuya of the Willamette Valley and other tribes. Um, along the shores, you'll find the tarweed. Um, it's a wild sunflower. And this actually grew pretty extensively in the Willamette Valley areas historically prior to contact. But after contact, folks didn't like it because it uh, has a tarry substance and it got on the livestock, things like that. So they pretty much tried to eradicate it. Um, so we're working today on efforts to kind of get populations of it established in bigger areas. It's got a fairly small seed, so you need a, a fairly thick patch of it to get a, a good quantity of it. There's several different varieties, There's, um, but they're kind of scattered and you'll find them uh, along the riverbank areas and up a little bit on little higher drier lands, maybe where the oaks are and places like that. Um, but our tribes will gather it and traditionally what would happen for this plant is those areas where it grew thickly, um, fire would be used uh, to burn those areas first and it would actually burn off that tar tarry substance. Um, and then the seed, that seed fan I showed you early would be used to go and hit the plants and knock them into a basket and that's how the seed was collected. Um, and then that seed would be ground up um, say for winter time and then often mixed like with hazelnuts and berries and things like that, um, the, the canvas um, as part of the food source for the winter time. And of course, I'm sure you're familiar with cattail and tule, seen it along uh, the rivers here. This one's actually uh, off the slough area, and then the other is further actually the Eugene area, but there's lots of tule here, such as Smith and Bybee Lakes area, um, and along the, the uh, lower slough area, um, mixed along the Columbia slough also. But here is a really nice patch. You can see how tall I am and how tall that stuff is grown. Um, so that's a really nice tall patch there. It's really nice to see. Um, and um, these are used again in different purposes, um, primarily for basketry. There's edible parts of it too. Um, and then our tribe will use it to make mats. Um, 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 some the summer houses were made out of the two green cattails sometimes too. So um, historically we had a lot of uses and we still continue to do a lot of basketry and make the mats and things like that um, for it today.
the acorns. I mean, yeah, acorns. And the oak trees were pretty important. And um, here you'd find them up in the on the hills above the water level, where it's a little drier. Um, but these were pretty important, and we've we found uh, uh, caches of them, like at um, Salvi's Island, where um, one of the ways that if you ever try to eat, eat a acorn, you know, it's pretty bitter, um, not really tasteful in, in that condition. And the tribes had a method of removing that bitterness, which was the tannin in them. And um, one of the ways was to bury them in springs. Um, they put them in baskets, cover them, and then bury them where there were springs and store them there for that a period of time. And it would leach out that bitter taste in them. Um, and there was, there's been baskets and caches of these, caches of these found on Salvi's Island. Um, and there, there you had the springs, but you also had that inner, um, the inner tidal movement. Um, and they had them stored in those areas um, to help remove that, the tannin from them. Um, so the waters were very important as part of that process of those springs are, and using the rivers for that uh, movement of the water with the tides to kind of keep, go, keep moving and then removing that tannin source. So that's just kind of a really quick overview of sharing because um, we have several, a couple other presenters. So I just wanted to kind of give you a quick tease, I guess, of some of the uses we have, but pretty much any of the native plants along the river, we had some type of use for them. Um, and we still continue today to use a lot of those plants. Um, so the importance of the water quality and the connection to the landscape along the riverside, the repairing areas, et cetera, are of course very important to us because uh, there are foods that we do want to consume and use. Um, and then the things that we grab, gather for utility, utility purposes, like for the basket tree and other purposes. Um, so I'll just kind of big shout out for the work that your group does and helping try to try to fix the things along the rivers um, so that we can continue to do these things. Um, and I think we'll have questions a little later. later. So Ayumasi, many thanks. Oh, thank you. Um, that was just could not be more wonderful. Does anyone have just a question they're dying to ask right now? Anyone? Or we can go on to um, Mary or um, Dominic. Who wants to go next? I think Dom's still trying to get in. Oh, Scott, have you let Dominic in? Scott? Can anyone find Scott? Scott is That's trying to let him in. Um, I think the problem is he got blocked the first time around, and so he probably needs to leave the meeting and rejoin it so he reappears in the waiting room. Hi, so this is Scott. I'm working on the phone right now with uh, okay. Dominic. Okay, then we better go with Mary. Anyway, yeah. I, I just want to say that I hope everybody who's here, um, you know, enjoyed Greg's presentation as much as I did, and that when we see restoration projects um, happening along the river that, you know, we keep, you know, what he's in their healthy foods. So I'm looking forward to having Mary and I'm so excited that um, Multnomah Soil and Water made um, the Superfund one of their, um, I don't know whether you say strategic goals, but, you know, definitely they're joining our, our team and I hope she can see, you know, what a great group of people it is um, to work with. So welcome, Mary. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, thank you, Greg. That was a beautiful presentation and helped get our minds back to where they needed to be. Um, I am calling from Gladstone where I, I hail and I've planted some strawberries here. So that, that particular tidbit made me very happy to learn about, but all of it was very beautiful. And um, I intentionally was uh, presenting a shorter presentation because I wanted to hear from Greg and Don more because I've had the great um, experience of hearing each of them talk and I, I really want to give them more airtime, but I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'm going to start a presentation, I hope. Let's see if it works. Can you see me there? Yes? Thumbs up from somebody? 
Yes. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so um, I'm calling from the, the Soil and Water Conservation District. So before jumping into um, what we hope to kind of um, bloom in, in partnership with you all, um, I was asked to share a little bit about kind of the place of plants and restoration work that I've done, as well as the, the plants of place, so native plants that we're, we're focused on. Um, I'm very humbled, like, as I said, to be presenting alongside um, Greg and Dom, and I'm very happy to be here as I've worked for um, almost 14 years now in the Linton area um, with many of your neighbors to help restore different uh, property sites and, and put in different um, demo gardens and whatnot. Um, and as Sarah mentioned, um, excited to be exploring what our role might be within the Portland Harbor at this point. We're late to the party, but we're happy to be here. Um, and um, in general, you know, over time, you know, I've I've, uh, I've witnessed kind of this, you know, topic of plants being kind of core and central to any any land healing we're trying to do. So I think it's a very relevant topic for sure. Um, I'm going to breeze through a couple of things just in case you don't know soil and water conservation districts. Um, this is my little kind of lineup here. Um, but then I'll quickly get into um, just some Linton project highlights and a little bit about our hopeful project uh, partnership with you all. Um, so just to start, if you're not familiar with my organization, um, soil and water conservation districts bloomed out of the Dust Bowl era. Um, and in this particular case, um, you know, all the native plants that we're providing, soil erosion, protection, clean water uh, with their roots, food and medicine for people and wildlife and soil health through their organic matter were removed and replaced with monocultures um, and, and regularly harvest and, and soils tilled. I know you all know this history lesson, probably don't need to go into it, um, but of that and the catastrophe is born of that, um, soil and water conservation districts were born throughout the country. Um, wherever you go, um, you should be able to find a soil water conservation district covering um, an area. And we're small local government districts like a school or fire district with a, fo a focus of delivering uh, conservation. Um, and our primary bailiwick is uh, non-regulatory conservation delivery through uh, providing resources, information, expertise. Um, and of course, because of what came to be with uh, the Dust Bowl, our focus has been um, privately owned lands um, and specifically farms, forest lands and ranches that were working lands, but now in urban areas, we've expanded focus. And so folks like me, uh, urban conservationists are popping up more and more in different cities within soil and water conservation districts. Um, so if you're a property owner, you'll see us on your tax bill uh, and your property taxes. And that's kind of our, our primary focus, although we also uh, do a lot of fundraising for big projects to kind of bring in more, more funding for priority work. Um, yeah. Um, and I've been told um, by uh, local tribal members uh, uh, much about the, the history before that um, in regards to uh, the indigenous uh, individuals that have tried to forewarn farmers and ranchers of how to better care for their lands. Um, just as Laura, or not Laura, sorry, Sarah was mentioning um, in the great introduction, um, you know, there were <laughs> time immemorial, great care for the lands that we're speaking about now. And we know that plants are, and removal of the plants that were on site are an important part of that story. Um, so I wanted to take a moment before really diving in to acknowledge the original indigenous people of the land that we are uh, discussing um, and uh, the importance of uh, working together to better um, understand and work uh, with traditional ecological knowledge and relational worldview of the land and all things living upon it, including plants, which I've learned from um, many of my Indigenous friends to look to as teachers, caretakers, and partners in the land healing that we need to do today. Um, I also wanted to further recognize that we're here for the, due to the land displacement, cultural erasure, and other sacrifices that were forced upon them and remind ourselves that most of us are guests on this land and must do our best to honor the original people through authentic cultural narratives and continued caring of and giving to the air, water, plants, animals, and ecosystems that make up this land community. Um, 
I just wanted to say that before diving in. And um, so this is this is going to be a little basic, so I think I can whirl in through this. I, I can hear all your plant knowledge, so we don't need to really probably go through <laughs> um, the place of plants and restoration in too much depth. Um, but um, when we think about the, the place of plants um, and restoration, um, goodness, it's, it's um, absolutely critical in so many different ways and places. When we think about our soil, water, air, you know, health, the regulation of natural systems, the base of our food chains, uh, human health, um, as Greg was uh, speaking to, medicinal uses, um, and then now, unfortunately, with climate change, uh, urban heat island impacts. Um, we've learned much about how stress reduction is, um, is possible when you can spend some time forest bathing, as they call it. Um, and also, of course, food security, whether it be with gar local garden space or with places to harvest um, and hunt. Um, and then also the importance of a, of a well managed uh, plant system. Um, if well managed, um, as we know, uh, of much of the lands that we're speaking to in the Lamet Valley here were managed with fire. And thus we had much reduced wildfire risk. And so um, if we can mimic that or again use fire as much as we can. Uh, we understand that there's there's reduced risk in that regard. And of course, the cultural and recreational benefits, and then the the indicators that plants can be of, of monitors of ecosystem health. What a reminder of how, how great they are! All the things they're doing for us, right? Um, and then just to speak to the benefits of native plants specifically. So, when we talk about using native plants in restoration, we're talking about a plant that's native to or evolved in an area over thousands of years that uh, are well suited to our climate, our soil conditions, weather patterns. Uh, and then they've also developed mechanisms to combat diseases, pests, uh, predators. And as a result, they require less maintenance, um, little watering, and um, typically, you know, no pesticides remain vigorous. Um, and um, diverse systems of native plants, especially in our West Hills, we know it's important, are uh, very critical to have those deep and diverse roots to reduce erosion, uh, to treat stormwater, and to allow water to penetrate um, into the ground. And then um, we know that um, some seeking a low maintenance landscaping options are going to native plants for that need. Um, and then lastly, uh, you know, we know many different wildlife uh, have very symbiotic and very niche uh, relationships with different plants um, and critically new, need maybe one particular species to maintain themselves or at least um, subsets and communities to maintain themselves. So um, those, are, those are just a little list of all the benefits of native plants or the plants in place I'm saying here. Um, and then also when we're thinking about restoration and kind of the, the plants in place, we think about ecoregions and we're here, you can't really see that slide, it's kind of a yucky picture here, but um, are you seeing my slides as I change them? I hope so. I'm just realizing you might not be seeing that. <laughs> no, no. Oh no. <laughs> okay. What is that slide? Oh shoot. I just realized I'm like, I'm looking at a slide, but you're not looking at this slide. Darn. Well, um, let me see what I can do. Why is that not working? Oh, that's why. Okay. Those were the pictures. Sorry about that. Um, there's the picture. <laughs> there's that. There's my benefits of native. And this now we're now we're caught up. Um, I'm so sorry about that. I was I've got two screens and they confuse me sometimes. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, so I was just speaking to the fact that we have ecoregions that we look to to help us sort out and also source specifically plants for our restoration projects. Um, we've had different restoration projects uh, have issues um, if we've actually sourced even the same species uh, native to the Pacific Northwest, say, you know, from the coast, we had some issues happen uh, when we've sourced different, this exact same species, but out of a different ecoregion. So we, we're pretty picky about the nurseries we work with and where they're sourcing their, their plant stock um, and restoration projects. And then um, I'm not going to speak to this because Dom hopefully will be coming on and that's, that's going to be his main shtick 
um, speaking to the kind of regulatory framework and um, different pieces that are uh, available from the city of Portland to help guide what plant communities um, we historically um, have Not here in Portland. Uh -oh. Sounds suspicious. Oh no. Oh, there he is. We got him. Hi, Dom. No, I do not know anyone named uh -oh. Naheem. <laughs> Dom, you need to mute. What is Naheem backwards? Dom, you need to mute. Oh, sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry. We're trying. <laughs> You're okay. <laughs> we're gonna. We're we're just trying to be kept on our toes. I think this whole time. <laughs> um, so anyway, Don's going to speak to that piece. Um, but of course, we look to um, the great resources offered through the city and others. And when we're thinking about the plant communities that we should be placing in a, in a restoration project, um, as well as different uh, plants that we might label as, um, and this is a much debated topic right now, what we should even be calling said plants, um, nuisance or non-native introduced invasive plants, so plants that can be monoculture forming and can disallow those native plant communities from th thriving and can also cause, uh, in some cases, human health or economic harm. Um, but at the end of the day, we're trying to get the right plants in the right place for restoration projects. Um, so um, for Linton projects and offerings, we have quite a few. And um, I hope if any of this strikes your interest, you'll contact me after this talk. Um, we do offer, um, you know, everything from individual property conservation plans, like the, um, the plan I've had the pleasure of working with Sarah on, which I know from my kiddos, this was before I was even pregnant, I think was my first, it was at least a decade ago, I got to do that with Sarah <laughs> and some of her neighbors. Um, and um, we also have funding, project management, and monitoring resources to provide sites. Um, our focus, like I said earlier, is um, privately owned land, but we also do a lot of work on schools, and that's another focus of ours. Um, we, uh, we are, our plans do center around a number of plant communities found in the Linton area, including bottomlands, wood, oak woodlands, riparian zones, and upland forests. Um, and I'm not using the exact mixed stand, you know, I, I'm not using the exact terms that Dom can tell you about. Uh, <laughs> um, we also do a lot of working lands plans, as I said before, so uh, if you are on this call and happen to be up farther in the hills in any timber operations, we help with prescriptions on that. Livestock management and other guidance uh, is available. Um, we do partner with a number of different nonprofits uh, to try to kind of make our projects as impactful and inclusive as possible. Um, and we also uh, facilitate farm bill funding to different projects. Um, and in the Linton area, those have largely been wetland and fish passage restoration bottomland uh, projects, uh, just north actually of the Linton boundary. And then um, I've got pictured here our uh, canopy weed crews. We're going on 10 years of free removal of ivy, invasive ivy and clematis um, in neighborhoods adjacent to Forest Park, uh, many times working with Linton residents. Um, and as of last year, we reached 411 participating landowners and we've saved or have freed uh, 3,000, or sorry, 30,400, 186 trees. So a lot of trees, so that's exciting. Um, so if that project is, is of interest and you've got some ivy, you, we can help out with that too. Um, and then we offer educational programming for youth and adults. Um, including um, design build workshops, and um, we are renewing a focus for school and community gardens and demonstration gardens. Um, and um, yeah, I think that's kind of the main the main shtick there. Um, and then finally, you know, the partnerships that we're hoping to uh, explore with you all um, after a very robust long range business planning process that I had the pleasure of uh, shepherding us through. Um, we've landed on um, wanting to reach out to your group and others in the Portland Harbor um, with a desire to increase uh, community resiliency to climate change in the Northwest Industrial and Portland Harbor area. Um, we've identified this you know, particular area as a focus at, at a minimum for the urban heat island uh, work that we're hoping to address. But 
um, we're, we're very interested in kind of exploring our role uh, being newer to all the groups that have been out here to see what what we could best offer you all um, and others trying to heal the land in this particular area. Um, we also have um, another new, we're calling it strategic direction, um, that emphasizes um, helping create and foster opportunities uh, for folks to connect with the land and access land. Um, so that may or may not be something that uh, your group is particularly interested in, but I know from talking to Sarah, it sounds like there's some interest in more river access. So that could be another thing that we could be thinking about and talking about together. Um, and that's it. So I wanted to go quick. I want to make sure we hear from Dom um, and have time to ask questions. I hope that wasn't too basic, but I hope that was helpful if anyone <laughs> is interested in working with us. Hi. That was great, Mary. Thank you. This is Scott Burr. No, it was great, Mary, because I, I don't think everybody knows what you do. And, yeah. and I, um, I think you're a really important partner. So I, I think it, I mean, I, I'm just really thrilled that that's part of your new plan. So thank you. Okay, here we go with Dom. I think they call you Dom. Dominic Mays, biologist and environmental regulatory coordinator with City of Portland's Bureau of Environmental Services. He's a well-respected local botanist that has helped revise the Portland plant list and coordinate numerous other restoration related projects and policy work within the city and beyond. Um, he's gonna tell us how the Portland plant list came to be, how it's been used and misused in city regulations and more about local restoration projects and initiatives. So, okay, Dominic. Thanks, Sarah. And now I'm on a telephone due to the, the interesting evening and in technological uh, excitement. So I'm on a phone and Scott's going to drive my slides, which I just emailed to him. Mary, I'm sorry I started babbling uh, during your talk. And Sarah, that's kind of right. What I did was I I, have to, I felt two appropriate talks that I dusted off and kind of melded together. I, I work for Bureau of Environmental Services at the city of Portland and with our friends at the Bureau of Planning, we revisited and revisited and updated the Portland plant list in 2016. It was actually a four year process. Um, and so please advance the slide, Scott. Oh yeah, well, you know, it's gonna be slow. I'm gonna be asking Scott to do a lot of clicking. I was gonna click through this and be changing pictures. It's just gonna to have to be. So yeah, there's the Portland plant list. Uh, what is the Portland plant list? Well, it's this document that kind of came about organically as well, well as I understand it. It's uh, the first iteration was in 1991. And really it's a list of lists. Um, it has a native list within it now, a nuisance plant list, which is kind of our exotic weeds. Um, it's got an airport futures list, so what the port can plant around the airport. Um, it's got lots of lists within it. Um, as I said, that first iteration, as far as I can, was when I was trying to figure out the history of it, goes back to 1991. And originally it was kind of just an educational document. It was a native plant list listing plants that people, I know some of the people and we knew some of the names, but other people we don't know. And people created this list of native plants in Portland. And um, what we'll see in a second, some of those plants were actually native, some weren't. It was originally kind of an educational document, but as the city began to need to have a need for a list of native plants for like E-Zone, situations eventually for city code, what was a native and what was not, it began to accumulate this regulatory nexuses. Um, it became more of a regulatory document. Um, I have to scoot in closely and look at the uh, what I wrote here. Um, it was compiled over the years as these increased needs and um, functions of the list changed or were altered and modified, more and more people begin adding things to it, often with little attribution. So why is this added to the Portland plant list? Well, we don't really know. Those people retired long ago. Um, 
and it eventually began to accumulate information. It always had information beyond the list from the beginning about habitat and um, sort of where plants live and what they do and what plant communities exist in Portland. But folks fiddled with that and added to that. And a lot of that information was very well-meaning, but is incorrect from an ecological standpoint, a lot of the habitat discussions. Also, a lot of the ethnobotanical stuff was very well-meaning, but a lot of it wasn't appropriate. And obviously never consulted with any uh, indigenous people. Um, was, like I said, very well-meaning, but a lot of it's incorrect and more appropriate for other parts of North America. Has technical issues. And some were really glaring to me when I first started working at the city. I'd come up from Corvallis as a conservation biologist seeing that Rubus ursinus was listed twice, once as a shrub, once as a vine. The shrub listing has this invalid macropetalus variety there, which was used just a couple times erroneously. Variety should, the VAR should not be italicized, little pet peeves for a botanist like me. Uh, click, Scott. And, you know, it was like, we've got to think, about, I'm a dorky botanist. How stringent do we, do we need to be? There's this ranunculus ficaria, uh, formerly known as Chilodonia mag magus. So ranunculus ficaria, now ficaria verna, lesser celandine, a nasty buttercup weed around Portland. Th that other plant, the Chilodonium, is in a totally different family. These two are not the same species. So somebody saw that the common name was similar, lesser and greater celandine, assumed they were the same plant. And so they took Chilodonium magus off the nuisance plant list, off the weedy list for the Portland plant list. They're not, they're totally different, different families. Both should have been retained. So how did that happen? We want, I, I wanted to fix that again as a dorky botanist. Please click, Scott. Um, these species, and I, I can't even, I'm doing this off of memory, I can't even read this on my phone, but these were, I believe, the Cockleburs, Strumar, Strumarium. Um, these are listed in the native list. So, hey, great, I have a restoration project on the river. These grow in mud flats, tidal mud flats along rivers. Let's plant this in a restoration project and go ahead and click Scott. But it's also listed in the same Portland plant list as a B rank nuisance plant, so an exotic plant, which is it? Well, both of those are pretty nasty weeds, but somebody somewhere along the way listed them as natives. Um, so that's obviously a problem, and it, it, it's a problem for an ed educational document. It's a big problem in a regulatory document. Go ahead and click. Thank you. Um, the natives list was pretty good, but then you've got situations like these um, with the lupin, uh, Lupinus microcarpus, I think that's showing. Those are herbaria records, so from like the 1850s on where botanists have collected this species. Obviously, it's not been collected near Portland and obviously not in a climate near Portland. So should we be including this native to Oregon species as a native on the Portland plant list? You could argue no, and I did argue no, and that's what happened. We created a radius basically of the Portland metro area was native for the Portland plant list. Um, and also you had situations where you had plants that were native just across the river in Washington um, that were much closer than this lupin, this little lupin, that probably you could argue are much more closer to native, even though they aren't in the state of Oregon, technically native to the state of Oregon. You can go ahead and click. And so where should we delimit these species? Yep, you can keep clicking. Um, I argued for constricting um, the palette for the sake of nativeness. If we're gonna be serious about what's native and what's gonna function in our natural areas and in our yards and gardens, it should be based on the habitats and the floral associations we have in Portland. And of course, if you rely on the nursery industry, which I was a part of for many years, I uh, loved it. Um, they're gonna tell you things are native in a pretty, from a pretty broad range, right? Um, there were issues about trying to adapt for climate change, but I find a lot of those arguments um, to be valid, like trying to plant things from further south that can deal with hotter weather but we just don't know enough 
yet to be fiddling with that. And I just have, I feel like uh, scientists have tried, has, have opened too many Pandora's boxes when it comes to trying to anticipate uh, change in the future. Go ahead and click. Thank you, Scott. So we created process improvements. We I tried to increase the scientific rigor and transparency of the process. Originally, it had been folks sitting around a table in the Portland building and just, you know, dorky plant people putting stuff on lists and taking them off. The problem is, is that there's subsets of these lists that have regulatory import now for titles 11, tree code, 29 landscape provisions for maintenance, and 33 for development. And that Title 29 provision, um, a proportion of the A-ranked nuisance species, so the worst of the worst of invasive plants, not that any plant is bad or good, but the worst of the worst invasive plants, uh, the city can enter into abatement proceedings with private property owners and threaten to take their property if they don't take care of a certain weed. It's a very small, number of weeds, but and they're nasty. But you better have a good reason if and you better be able to show how you decided what went on this list if you're going to do that, I, I thought. So we wanted a transparent process. Go ahead and click Scott. So we created, yep, you can click all the way through that standard operating procedure. We created um, criteria-based screening of requested amendments to the list. So we often receive requests from the public, from city staff, from Metro, from folks to please list this or take this off the list, or this is not really a bad weed, or this is really a bad weed. Um, expert reviewers, I wanted outside of the city reviewers. I didn't want city staff making these dis final decisions on what was added. I want, wanted professional botanists and people in the field of weed science. And I wanted a quantitative risk assessment for these nuisance species that ranked them. So it wasn't just off the seat of your pants. Go ahead and click Scott. So we developed and click again, thank you. A public tracking notice, so a tracking form, so that every time somebody, whether they were city or the member of the public or a Metro staff member, Oregon Parks and Rec wanted something listed or not, they we could track it through this form, basically vet it. You'd have to state, and you can click again, Scott. All these criteria for changing um, the Portland plant list, adding a native plant, removing a native plant, like I said before. Now you would have to um, have a good reason for doing it. Refer to the authorities listed there in that fine text, which I can't read and you probably can't either. Go ahead and click, Scott. You can click again and just go through that. So after that initial public notice, we sent out a notice to the public, to organizations around Portland, around the metro region, that we were accepting submissions for changes to the Portland plant list. We did this in 2016. We also had requests for changes that had accumulated through the pre previous couple of years. We, review, we reviewed these by staff. There was a few pretty out there ones, um, which didn't make much sense, but a lot of them were valid. Go ahead and click. And go ahead and click again. I'm just gonna tear through that. We uh, changed a bunch of scientific, we reviewed it by staff. We uh, did simple name changes without much review, but then we used expert review for actual additions and removals uh, and changes in ranks to the nuisance plant list. And that nuisance plant list, once again, is the exotic invasive plant list of the uh, section of the Portland plant list. Go ahead and click again. Here's the quantitative risk assessment we created. Uh, this basically, if you had a exotic plant was being proposed for inclusion in the nuisance plant list, um, this would determine whether it should be listed and if it should be listed, what its rank would be. There are four ranks in the Portland plant list, five actually, I'm sorry, A, B, C, and D, with A being the quote worst, D being the most, I guess, ubiquitous and innocuous and then a W list for watch. Go ahead and click again, Scott. 
Thank you. And then uh, the species that were proposed for listing fell out through here. Um, I proposed some stuff for listing as a staff member from the city, but I didn't rank them. Outside experts ranked it. I could have easily done the old process where I just deter, I, as a botanist working for the city, I would have listed something myself. I thought this was much more transparent and much more above board to have outside folks doing it. Go ahead and click again. So there it is in a nutshell. Um, as it stands, the Portland plant list, no changes were made to any of the pros. So any of the descriptions of habitat, ethnobotanical notes, anything like that in the 2016 update. And in the last few years, there's been a groundswell, minor groundswell, uh, voice is clamoring for a new update for the Portland plant list where those habitat descriptions are addressed and the ethnobotanical um, aspects are addressed and we bring in some eye technology and um, actually consult with some um, folks representing indigenous communities um, to get their buy-in. Like I said, it was very well-meaning the verbiage in there um, previously, but it just comes off as insensitive and, and um, incorrect in a lot of places. So I look forward to that. Or we'll be talking about that, about that in the city soon enough. Go ahead and click again. And here's where I kind of move into to the other talk, which was based on the Portland plant list use in uh, restoration. And please cut me off if I don't have enough time, but I'll just go through this. I don't know when we're looking to end here. Anybody? You're doing okay. Okay. Go ahead and click, Scott. Thank you. Uh, this man here is a guy named Aldo Leopold. As some of you may be familiar with him. He was a famous uh, wildlife biologist and restoration biologist. This quote is attributed to him. The uh, first rule of restoration, um, ecology of biology should be do no harm. Click again. Got a lot of clicks here. Restoration is difficult. It has lofty goals. We talk about, go back, thank you. Um, we talk about these lofty goals. We, we talk about resiliency and biodiversity and native habitats and all this stuff, um, often without clear targets. And that's sometimes okay. Um, even when we do have clear targets, which are often the result of some regulatory threshold we need to meet for native cover or something like that. Our results, uh, the results of our restoration attempts, and I should say I was a restoration biologist for years and years, so um, bear with me. This is, um, is proved, I gave this talk a couple times before it was a bit contentious. Um, even when we do have clear targets, our efforts often result, if we're not careful, and instability to the system and homogenization of the systems we're working in. Um, the Portland plant list is a fantastic document. It was groundbreaking for municipality to have that. It does reflect more common commercially available species, which is okay, that's its purpose. Uh, but those characteristics of those common, more commercially available species uh, may not be the best tools for achieving those goals such as biodiversity, resiliency above. Go ahead and click. On the left there, you see um, a schematic, a drawing, an illustration of what um, pre-settlement, Euro-American settlement, what the Willamette Valley looked like. Of course, that's further upriver than where we're at and what it looked like in 1991. If you notice some things, the river's been channelized, the bottomland prairies in Savannah have been lost to uh, agriculture, but you've also noticed you lost a lot of that foothill habitat, which was refugia for a lot of open growing species, prairie species, savanna species, uh, due to fire suppression once we eliminated and uh, a genocide happened on the landscape and we eliminated the native culture, which had stewarded um, the landscape for so long. We had a sort of a wall of dug fur coming down out of the mountains, kind of eliminated a lot of habitat. And click again, keep that in mind. Um, there you go. So, some t um, so thanks Mary for listing Portland plant list, of course now. 
I can't read my slide. <laughs> what I tried to identify in restoration biology, especially for this talk, and in my career is that we all, we embark upon restoration efforts. We are all informed and directed, whether we know it or not, at least partially by our bias, the biases that we have, what we've grown up with, what we like, what we don't like. And sometimes that bias is due to um, umbrella species here. It's often salmonids are driving restoration. And so you're restoring for salmonid habitat. That's what my bureau does a lot of, planting lots of woodies that keep waterways cool with shade. Um, other considerations such as exotic suppression, so keeping weeds down factor in, planting really densely beyond any historic um, plant densities. We also have our personal biases. We plant the things we know and like, just like gardening. So are we really restoring landscapes if we're implementing these biases or just restoring for a single species? You can make the argument we are. Um, you could also make the argument we should be more careful in restoration. Click again, Scott, thank you. I have, and you can click again, what I call the seed catalog approach, which is a focus on widely available charismatic plants. And this is informed by the things we like to see. We like wildflowers and charismatic woody plants that we can identify on the landscape. We're informed by these uh, truly wonderful field guides like Pojar and McKinnon on the left there, but they are focused on charismatic species that the layperson might recognize on a hike. And their wonderful books are fantastic. And many of those plants are essential and wonderful components of uh, restoration uh, efforts. Click again. You take, and click again one more time, please. You take a species or a genus like Musula, the wood rushes, probably the most commonly encountered species in the Willamette Valley in Mesic, so that's kind of half wet, half dry, and upland or xeric prairies in the Willamette Valley is Musula multiflora. Um, yet this species in all my prairie restoration for years before coming to the city, I never saw it specified in planting pallets or available at any uh, native plant nurseries, yet it's probably got a very important role uh, in prairie ecosystems. Yet where is it? It's a drab species. Who wants to buy that and plant that? Click again. What we want are these wonderful, truly wonderful species like this giant camas, Camasia leclinii, um, and you know, very important first foods plant, wonderful plant, it's gorgeous, but that's success to us is seeing these large charismatic species or these showy species, wildflowers, kind of like what we would want to see in our gardens. And click again. Then you take these rare and showy natives like Euphorbia crenulata. Um, nobody's growing that, it's got toxic sap. It's, I've seen it once in all my botanical forays in the Willamette Valley, it, it, it decades of work. Seen at one time, it's an awesome rare showy, an uh, unshowy plant. It's probably got associations with rare insects, etc. You never see that. Why are we not planting that? Why are we always planting the showy stuff? I'll click again. And click again. It's not great for telling someone else to click. Thanks, Scott. I appreciate it. No uh, problem. I, I'm happy to do this. Uh, thanks, buddy. Focused on Oregon ash. Man, what a wonderful species as cultural import. Um, it's one of the most valuable workhorse trees we've ever had in the Willamette Valley. It grows in so many different conditions. It can get huge. There's Toby Query looking at one on West Hayden Island. So valuable, but it is doomed. Click again. By the emerald ash borer in greenhouse studies, this beetle, which is not yet here on the West Coast, just kills every, it's doomed. The Oregon ash, I hate to say it, is gonna be functionally extinct eventually, and probably sooner than later once this thing arrives. Once it arrives, there's nothing you can do. Say goodbye to Oregon ash. It's not gonna go extinct, but it'll be, like I said, functionally extinct on the landscape. Partners, not the city of Portland, thankfully, partners in the region are still planting tens of thousands of this tree, this wonderful tree every year, to shade our waterways and, and river restoration. And they're just setting up a catastrophic heating uh, and cooking of our local waterways. 
unfortunately. Uh, the upper Tualatin, the mid, I'm sorry, the lower mid Tualatin are, is probably like 80 to 90% ash along its whole stretch, uh, averaged out. Click again. We do it, we plan it because we have the need for shade credits and native cover in, in shade. It does great, but it's not going to do great with this beetle. And click again. IPM stands for Integrated Pest Management, and this is mostly the result of botanical naivete. So there, click again, see if I got the arrows in there. It often results as from stabilization. Stabilization is a term we use in the restoration industry. When a cool property is purchased by a public entity and we go in and stabilize it, but we've purchased that property because it's cool, because it's neat, it has intrinsic value. It had some elements that really appealed to us, rare birds, rare plants, et cetera, great community, floral community. And one of the first things we do is go in and have crews with herbicides start spraying weeds. Well, there's a lot of plants out there and you know this, these arrows point to sprayed out Circium brevistylum, a rare thistle because uh, these very well-meaning crews saw thistles and sprayed them out. Those thistles are gone. They were there for hundreds, thousands of years on that property until it was, quote, conserved and re restored. So kind of counterintuitive. And had, I, you know, folks like myself not come across that, nobody would have known because it never came back from that site, from that property. Click again. We have four native Circeum species in the Willamette Valley. I said some now rare, they're, they're all really rare. From weed control efforts, they are really rare. Click again. And I see them sprayed out all the time. That's, yeah, sorry, Circeum brevistyle. I already said that. Which one is the exotic bull thistle? Which is the native Circeum eduli, a different rare native Circeum, the native Rare rosette is on the left, the exotic on the right. And why even spray out the exotic? It's a pretty plant. Bumblebees love it. Native bees love it. Just leave it alone. Click again. Thank you. We often plant in our restoration. Uh, and I say we often. This happens often enough to annoy me, but probably not often a lot. Um, but we, uh, we plant, especially with non-showy species, this happens. We plant plants that are misidentified. So this is Carex divulsa, C. divulsa there. It is a huge sedge with um, Carex genus. Uh, it is exotic. It is a weed. And click again, probably click a couple times. It is grown and sold as Carex tumulicola in the West, our native foothill sedge. Yet it is not. About 80 to 85 percent of the nurseries, native plant nurseries, sell this exotic weed in the back, and it's sold by the tens of thousands for use in restoration and planted everywhere. It's extremely weedy and prolific cedar. It's making its way down the Willamette from Willamette Park on the west side as we speak from plantings years ago, and it just won't go away. Go ahead and click again. Uh, we planted it. We, the city of Portland, all in bioswales all over the city. We bought it from nurseries as the native foothill sedge. Go ahead and click again. Click again. I already said that. Yeah, responsibility lies with plant producers too. They're still selling it everywhere in the, along the West Coast. Even folks who know that it's not really native. Um, just like any field out there, there's good actors and bad actors. And the same thing is what you know, happens with plant producers too. Go ahead and click again. Thank you, Scott. Sometimes it actually is with natives that we air. Uh, we have a lot of native plant nurseries sell native stock in quotes. It's clearly hybridized or and or has weedy tendencies. That upper left photo is a stem of Rosa nutcana, or native nutca rose. But our native Nootka rose, when it's really native, doesn't have recurved prickles like that. It doesn't have that many prickles at the base. That's probably Rosa rubinigosa, or a hybrid of Nootkina and rubinigosa. You get showy species like that Clarkia amoena, farewell to spring on the lower right. Boy, click two more times, Scott. 
That middle photo is what our native Clark Amoena looks like. The left photo is a photo I pulled off the inter internet from a seed catalog online from uh, the seed company from Ypsilanti, Michigan. So it, you might think, eh, what's the big deal? You plant some showy plants. Um, big deal. But the big deal is when you have kind of rare natives like that middle plant and then the genetic material from these um, other plants get in there and it sort of changes how these plants look. It changes how they smell might change how they look in the ultraviolet spectrum. And you start messing with pollinators, you start messing with food webs, and you can't really get those genes back in the box. Click again. And then sometimes it's actually just with natives, with solid way to go natives, we plant really tough natives, a lot of juncus and species in our bioswales. And we often put these bioswales near natural areas, often with interpretive signs about how great our natural areas are, which they are. Uh, but we do these native plantings around these natural areas, and often we're planting natives that maybe aren't supposed to be there. And then folks and dog paws track these seeds up, these native plants up into these natural areas, and then these native plants take over. And I won't belabor that point too much, but trust me, it, um, I could name three parks off the top of my head, but won't where very rare plant habitat has been eliminated by native plants that were planted in a parking lot from people tracking the seeds up into these kind of pristine areas in the metro area. And click again. And I'm probably running out of time. Hitchhikers, soil-borne organisms, and plant pathogens. Often this happens with container plants. Go ahead and click. Again, a classic example of hitchhiking in plant container stock and restoration is exotic earthworms, super potent habitat modifiers from Europe with no analog. That top photo, that's an eastern hardwood forest. Top is where there's no earthworms. The bottom is like 20 yards away at the invasion front of the earthworms that were introduced by a restoration. Go ahead and click again. Big deal, looks a little different, right? You lose some understory herbaceous plants, but hey man, everything has impacts. And when you start scratching under the surface, you see that things aren't as simple as you thought. You have cascading food web impacts that can really mess things up. Go ahead and click again. And go ahead and click again. So it's, this isn't really well studied. I gave this talk two years ago and then somebody said, hey, did you hear what happened in California? This big Sierra Nevada chaparral planting, Sierra Nevada foothills. A nursery supplied tens of thousands of plants that were infected with a water mold, a phytophthora, and a devastating just 20,000 acre nature preserve this water mold that was introduced from poor sanitary practices at a nursery in the container stock that was infected is now basically killing every species of plant life across this whole huge preserve. So we got to be really careful about where we get our plants from and we need to inspect those plants as restoration managers and practitioners when we get them. Go ahead and click again, Scott. And the final one, it looks like I tore through this and Good time. Saggy genes is what I call this one. Um, this is plant materials again. So in that top middle photo, we have a plant you might all recognize and love, yarrow, Achillea millifolium. Um, and this is basically the same thing, a loss of local adaptation and genetic swamping. So that photo down there in the lower middle is a screenshot of the chromosome count database, which I'm sure you're all familiar with and look at every night before you go to bed. Um, it's an Israeli website, but you can see there's five, been 505, I think it said, uh, published studies delineating, delimiting chromosome counts for Yarrow. So basically, Yarrow, under some species concepts, is multiple species. And what we plant in restoration, what's available from every nursery I've seen, seed or a container plant, are these large, hugely robust yarrow plants. Um, the kind of plant 
you see at Home Depot in a one gallon pot, the kind of thing you want your front yard. But if you've seen our native yarrow somewhere out in the foothills of the Willamette Valley or um, somewhere far afield, it does not look like that. It usually is, um, is diploid, has a double set of chromosomes versus these polyploids, these large plants that have been developed uh, for marketing, for selling and appealing to people for their front yards. Yet that is the seed we get in restoration settings, the seed in the container plants. When we plant these plants out, they are functionally and structurally, I should say structurally and then functionally very different than native yarrow and often act as weeds, as bullies. Yet we pat ourselves on the back that we have this native cover. Now these plants are selected for nursery conditions and for appealing to the public very often, these woody plants and these showy plants. And it's similar to I have that photo on the right, I think it's similar or analogous to um, hatchery fish, hatchery salmonids, where they are adapted and bred kind of for hatchery conditions. And when they mix with the native populations, they can often have impacts that we really don't appreciate until it's too late. And click again, that might actually be it. And that was in unceremoniously the end of that talk without an ending slide. Well, thank you so much. What, what, that was just three great, great speakers that I hope will help inspire our um, river restoration. Do people have some questions for anyone? Or maybe Scott, you've got questions in the chat to manage. Yeah, I was just getting a look at those now. I don't actually see any questions in the chat. Does anyone have a question? I have a question uh, for Greg. You were talking about how some of the bulbs have become unedible because they sucked up the toxic materials and as an edible plant, it wasn't useful. But could they become useful as a reservoir for the toxic materials and then pull the plants out to get rid of the toxic materials out of the area? Um, what, what I was saying is, yeah, there are some plants, um, like there were some studies of Wapato and, it, and they were early on saying that it was uh, absorbing certain types of minerals and contaminants. Um, but I think that there's still some later discussion of, of, of to what extent that happens, but they were actually using it as a restoration plant um, for that purpose to draw out those contaminants in different areas. Um, from our perspective, um, when we look at the plants, um, we're looking long-term at the recovery of them. So if you have a contaminated area there, and we can work with different partners to get the restoration going. Um, we know it may take some time, it may take a hundred years maybe to recover an area, but uh, we're always looking to the future generations so that working now to start that recovery so that our future generations would have the opportunity to use those plants again. So that's kind of the, our travel perspective, how we look at the plants and, and um, I'm just really looking for that long-term recovery of them. If perhaps today um, they're not accessible or, or the con contamination and pollution is, uh, um, <clears throat> you know, severe enough that we can't um, use them for purposes right now. Yeah, well, I was going to use them as a contaminate removal uh, mechanism. Basically, it's my machine for cleaning the place up so you could then go back to the natural use of it. Um, I was not worried about what you were going to do in the long term. I was going to use them as the absorber to get rid of it now. Yeah. Um, and basically a different purpose, though. But since it did clean up some of the things that we can't use them to do the job for us. Yeah, there, there's actually um, a lot of activities surrounded around that, that where they do use plants to do those kind of things for purposes of a lot of the like um, 
wetland mitigation or wastewaters and stuff. They'll use different plants and stuff like that. I think BES has examples of what they've done um, for that purpose too, where they're planting like maybe cattail or things like that that have um, can absorb some of that stuff. Um, um, are, are using it for flow, et cetera. I know they have different plants that they use for different purposes um, uh, for things like that as part of re remediation. Okay. See a few other hands raised here. Uh, Laura, was your hand up first? Did you wanna ask a sure. question? Sure, this, this is a, a question for Greg and Mary and Dom. I was reading online the other day about how um, the concept of planting natives is beginning to change because of climate change. And so natives that thrived here for however many years are now beginning not to be so adaptive and that it's, it's now, we're at a point in time where we need to be starting, we need to be not restoring, but sort of redirecting in how we plant because the climate is changing and I wondered what your thoughts are about that. I, I can say something, which is that uh, I've been in discussions with folks in the region about that. And I just think we need to be really careful and thoughtful about it. Um, often plant genetics from the edges of ranges are show the inability to poorly adapt um, to new conditions. Um, and so there's been a lot of discussion about getting things from the southern end of the range of species that are native here. Uh, the forestry industry has looked, of course, has looked into this and put a lot of money into this with trees. What happens if we plant trees from seed zones that are further south in anticipation of climate change? Because they don't want their bottom line affected. And those trees from just a seed zone south, Douglas fir that's planted in the, in the Willamette Valley are totally destroyed by suites of insects and pathogens that are not, are unique in their densities and um, mixes up here in the Willamette Valley. So there's all the, all sorts of these other factors we need to be very methodical and thoughtful about. And I, I know there's this pressing need we have like the last summer and you think, boy, all these Western red cedars are dying everywhere. It's getting hotter and hotter, but I just, I, I just think we have such a poor track record as humanity of anticipating change and, and addressing it well when we start fiddling with mother nature. So I think the conversation needs to be there, but. I, I just, I want people to just slow down. Some of the conversations I hear are just, uh, they're serious, it's a serious thing, but it, I just, I urge caution when people are talking um, about what's called assisted migration. Thank you. Um, uh, there were some other hands raised. Um, so I'll go, Scott. Um, this is probably a naive question and whoever wants to answer it. How do you designate what's a weed and what isn't? Mary or Greg, I don't wanna be the only one to talk. Yeah, one of the things for us is, you know, you do have plants that are, you know, considered not native to the area. But then um, from tribe's perspective, you know, we're not, stagnant people like if we see new plants and people abuse them for different things or no they um some of them uh, are used by tribes today that are more recent um kind of uh, plants of the area um so you know it's that that balance between you know when it really becomes a nuisance it does it have medicinal properties saint john's wort you know is used historically uh, just as an example for medicinal purposes, et cetera, a lot of different plants. Um, so kind of looking at those and um, for us, a, a big question is how is it impacting other native plants that we use and rely on? Um, you know, as an encroaching, we have the, uh, the one of the uh, stinky bob, one of those relatives of it encroaching on some camas areas. 
Um, so, you know, we're working like this is a forest service area working with them to how to manage and, and deal with that, that issue. Um, and we're trying really hard not to use pesticides or herbicides on the, uh, herbicides on the, on the plants, but trying to find new ways to, to do it, which is, you know, going to be pretty tough, but we want to try different options be before doing the spraying. Um, so it's really, you know, that, that balance of, of trying to find um, <clears throat> um, what kind of benefits. And like uh, Dominic was saying, you know, some of them aren't very, very pretty looking, <laughs> but they still have important uses. Um, so um, just look in and see what that balance is. You know, we, we have the Himalaya blackberry, it's everywhere. Um, but now it's considered, you know, it has have beneficial uses for wildlife, et cetera. So is it necessarily to eliminate it all or maybe leave some areas with it, et cetera. Um, and so it's just a matter of balance, I think, of what people are willing, willing to live with. And, but trying to, you know, care for it too. It's like we had regular use of fire that would help manage a lot of these areas and we can't do that to that extent today. And, you know, I think maybe the, it's kind of changing on that, um, but um, <clears throat> we did have different ways that we could manage and care for things like that. Um, even other native plants encroaching on like prairies and stuff like that. Our ash, we have areas where the ash encroaches on that, our canvas area. And so regular fire is important for that purpose to keep it, um, you know, where it's naturally at. So there's lots of different kind of considerations like that. Can I add one more thing to that for what Greg was saying? Um, I just, I wanted to mention that from a regulatory framework in the past, uh, we've really looked at um, risks and risk assessment and really looked at kind of, okay, this plant is not from here and the negatives and we did not weigh in the benefits very fully aside from economic benefit, I would say in the most, for the most part from what I've seen. And so I would say, you know, really factoring in the benefits at this point is a newer thinking for the regulatory side of things in a kind of more robust way. And I, it's exciting to see that really starting to play into folks' decision-making at this point. I don't know if Don wants to add anything, but that, that particular kind of, it's all about biases, as Don was saying, and it's kind of like one person's weed is another person's treasure, right? But um, <laughs> Yeah, weed, weed law, well, you know, the technical the definition of a weed is any plant you don't want. So for early guys, you know, early Euro-Americans in the Willamette Valley, poisonous natives like larkspurs and buttercups, you get rid of those things. I mean, they poisoned them left and right. They were native plants. They were weeds. They were any plant you don't want as a weed. Much of the State weed laws, which are the regulatory term is noxious weeds. The city's term is nuisance plant. Noxious weeds are all exotics, but they are all ones that have economic impact to agriculture historically. That's changed a bit over time as folks uh, from soil and water conservation districts, people in cities have lobbied for other species to be included, but they are all exotics. But really a weed is any plant you don't want growing somewhere. And like Greg said, with cessation of indigenous burning, uh, Douglas fir and Oregon ash are two huge weeds of our prairies and open areas. I showed that image of you know the, the diagram, the drawing of the Willamette Valley then and now, and, Boy, Doug, you look at our oak woodlands and oak savannas in the foothills, and it's hard to find one where Doug firs are not killing, 80-year-old Doug firs aren't killing 500-year-old oak trees, Oregon white oaks. So Doug fir is a weed in that situation. I'm biased towards oaks. <laughs> Thank you. Everyone's got an opinion on that one. Yep, right. Um, we're at the bottom of the hour here, and um, we have time maybe for um, maybe two more questions. So, um, John, did you want to go next? Sure. Um, Dominic, you covered a lot of, a lot of territory, and um, it's hard oh, to pick hard. which part of that territory to ask the question about. I guess where I'm going to select is um, 
Do you think that maybe we are overly ambitious in terms of what we expect of our restoration sites, especially in these very uh, urbanized environments? Um, maybe we need to set our, for our, calibrate our performance standards to be more reflective of what's possible in some of these areas and to be a little more tolerant of what quote unquote weeds are, for example. Is that, uh, in the, does that go in the lexicon of restoration, do no harm? I mean, er, yeah. you know, especially in prairie situations where, you know, fire and flood was the um, the successional uh, determinant, uh, the pre, you know, setting succession back to early successional stage determinant. Now, we, where we don't have those, um, the tool of choice has become herbicides in many cases, and that can actually do much more harm than we would like to uh, think. And so, uh, anyway, I'll just throw that out there. That is a great question. I couldn't agree more. I think yeah, it depends on how old and how long the person's been working as a restoration biologist or ecologist on their expectations, right? After you've been in the field for a while, you realize what's possible. And that if you don't have some regulatory dagger, a guillotine hanging over your head, you know, in these thresholds, you have to meet, you work with the system, especially in that urban context. You said it really well. There's such intense propagal pressure from exotic species on the native plant communities that still exist, especially the non-woody native plant communities. It's just really intense and you got a constant flow of them. So you got to just pick your battles and think about function. And if there's something rare there, try to preserve it, do really perform really great surveys for plants, for birds, uh, reptiles, amphibians, try to preserve what's there that's unique. But man, you said it, you really just got to work with the system. You try to fight it too much, you're going to be fighting it the rest of your life. There's not enough resources for it. And especially with those disturbance regimes that have changed. We don't, I don't know what the, I missed the two previous talks. You know, the Willamette used to flood before the dam system, the post-World War II dam system on the upper Willamette and tributaries. I mean, the Willamette used to freeze over every eight years it doesn't anymore. I mean, the, the, the hydrologic system is so altered along the Willamette. It's so different and it's never going back to what it was. We can try to do little things, pulses of water in the spring. It, it's never going back. So we got to work with what we got and do the best we can and accept with grace those failures and learn from them when it comes to restoration. I'll let Scott handle that. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dominic, for that. Um, there was one question in the chat. What's a good alternative for uh, ash for restoring streams? And then it's, we'll turn it over to Sarah to close. Uh, it's tough with ash because it grows on the wettest soil series in the Willamette Valley. So the most inundated soils, lowest gradient systems we have in the Willamette Valley. It's not so apparent in Portland, but it is on the Swalton and all the tributaries of the mid and upper Willamette. Ash is the only thing that'll grow. You start getting a little bit drier, a little more mineral soils, and you start seeing an Oregon white oak come in. Um, occasionally, uh, white alder, which is not that common really anywhere in the valley, all this rhombitifolia. But really, Oregon ash handles that wettest soil series. And when it drops out, because of the emerald ash borer, what we're likely gonna see come in is one seed hawthorn, Critigus monogyna, and its secret identical twin, Critigus heterophila, which nobody knows about, which is all over Portland and the Willamette Valley. We're gonna see these non-native Critigus come in that really don't provide much shade for these really low gradient tributaries of the Willamette uh, in the, uh, on these wettest soil series. It's gonna be pretty devastating for water temperature slash water quality. Uh, on the Willamette when emerald ash borer arrives. So we should be planting now. And thankfully, colleagues of mine um, at the city of Portland are, are not planting Oregon ash anymore. They're planting Doug fir and cottonwood and Oregon white oak, which is a slow growing species. But will these recruit in perpetuity at that site? Probably not. It's gonna have to be managed. It's a lot of land to manage. Right. Uh, thank you, Dominic. I'm going to hand uh, over to Sarah. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to ask my question. I'm just going to um, 
thank everybody for coming. And um, I hope everybody enjoyed this, um, you know, winter turning spring evening to, um, to think about um, plants and um, it just, just delightful. And I thank everybody. And um, I know we'll all just do the best we can to, um, you know, restore, restore our riverbanks the best we can. And I am, I am nowhere near any of these speakers. I feel completely humbled, but I will meet people February 27th at noon at the, um, the fishing dock at Cathedral Park. And if anybody that, you know, I mean, if anybody who knows more than me wants to come, but we can walk along the river and do some plant identification and um, just kind of look at look at some of those areas that people have, I think maybe have done a pretty good job of um, restoration in front of the water lab and just kind of take a, a peek at that. We're, we're also gonna be taking some youth down to kind of evaluate the riverbanks later in the spring too, if anybody would enjoy working with youth to look at the plants along, um, along the lower Willamette River. We're gonna to try to do both sides and come up with kind of an assessment. So that's kind of fun too. So um, anyway. So while we have everyone here, does anyone have announcements they'd like to make? Um, well, Laura Bob Eaton may be gone, but the collaborative meeting will be next month this same second Wednesday of the month. Mm -hmm. That's true. And I know Bob Salinger isn't here, but he's he's really wanting everybody to pay attention to the um, E zones that are coming up in front of city council. Um, so he would love it if people would look at that because a lot of those E zones will will protect will protect um, plants. So. Anyway. Jessica? Yeah, thank you, Doug. Um, one thing I did want to uh, just put out there is that the Willamette Cove Working Group is looking for new community members to serve on the executive committee. Um, this is a space in which we have both um, uh, agencies and community members uh, serving as conveners. And this is one of the working groups of the Portland Harbor Collaborative. So I'll put my name in the chat, um, or excuse me, my email address in the chat. So if, if folks are interested, you know, please do do reach out and I can, I can share more information with you about that. So thank you everyone for persevering. Um, it's uh, pretty easy to become absorbed in a meeting about plants. So we were able to move past all that and uh, better luck next time. So thank you all for coming. Yeah, and we look forward to, you know, all the spring signs of spring that we are gonna all get to enjoy. So thank you so much to all of you. And a special thanks to all of our presenters. Um, that, that wasn't easy, but you were all great. Yeah, it was delightful. Just delightful. So, okay. Good night, Good night everybody. Thank you.